everybody welcome to will and drew's gaming retrospective you are listening to episode 111 it's the week of january 24th 2021 i'm your host drew and i am joined by that sexy guy over there will what's going on dude what's up drew how are you man oh man i'm i'm today's been kind of a day i am don't tell me you're tired (laughs) i am i am tired like i feel like i've just been on the go since i woke up and just doing all sorts of crazy things and you know getting ready for the show and and uh running errands and doing stuff around the house and i just realized that i had framed everything a certain way last week for damien and now i'm looking at our stream and it's not framed as nicely as it should be uh so (laughs) it's gonna be one of those nights i don't know if you could tilt your webcam back a little bit but like the whole top half of your face is like chopped off (laughs) oh no (laughs) here let me know when it's good all right oh that's uh that's already yep that's good yeah it's a little better yeah that's that's perfect man we'll keep it there (laughs) okay (laughs) i don't think we've ever encountered that problem before (laughs) uh no no this is this is the first time for everything i I really want to like uh at some point spruce up this whole thing and i want us to be like as clean and slick as possible. And um, for everybody that's tuning into the Twitch stream right now, twitch.tv slash WDGR podcast. Um, you know, it's kind of a work in progress. We evolve a little bit each week, right? <laughs> so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, baby anyway, steps, man, baby steps. That's, that is the goal. Um, baby steps to greatness. <laughs> I it's suppose. like a little PlayStation. That, you know, I feel like that's a, a uh, joke there. That's, oh, is it? Yeah, you know, greatness awaits. Uh, it's, it's more of like a PS4 thing. Like that was their whole uh, marketing slogan when they first kind of debuted their system. It so was greatness awaits. When when the PSP came out, was that like the baby steps kind of thing? <laughs> Potentially. I don't fucking know. <laughs> oh, man. So everything's good, man. You doing well? Yeah, man. I'm absolutely pumped for today's show. We have two uh, games that we're going to be reviewing. Mm. And they're they're pretty large games. So... Uh, I'm really excited to talk about those and, um, you know, hear your thoughts about uh, the game that you just beat as well. Yeah, man. Um, these we've been sitting on these reviews for a little while and we've just had a packed new year since, uh, well, basically the past three weeks, four weeks. We've had like, you know, shows pretty extensively planned. So we've both mm-hmm. been sitting on on these games uh, that we're talking about tonight, Uncharted 4 and Star Wars uh, Jedi Fallen Order. We've been sitting on these for a while and yep. uh, I'm looking forward to talking about them. I really hope that I'm personally not leaving any important details out of uh, Fallen Order. But, Same. You know, we'll we'll see how it goes, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Doing reviews on the show is is never easy. Writing them, I have a much easier time with. Yeah, um, I suck at both. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, folks, thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate you uh, checking us out. You can follow us on the web at www.wdgrpodcast.com. Of course, we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at WDGR Podcast. And you can watch us live on Twitch every Monday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash WDGR Podcast. Will, if somebody would like to check you out, how can they do so? Aside from looking at your screen, of course. Sure. A uh, little startup website called SoundCloud. Uh, so it's going to be soundcloud.com slash will underscore gear. And you can find me on Twitter at Scion Storm. Swing on by, say hello. So um, where do you want to start? You want to start with Uncharted or, or Star Wars? Dude, I don't even know, man. Um, I'm so like thrilled to talk about this game, but I have no <laughs> idea where to start. <laughs> Fair uh, enough. <laughs> you know, and it's it's kind of funny because you and i are not coming off of these games hot you know we right. beat them what a couple weeks ago at least so yeah well i beat um, um i beat fallen order before the new year so i've been saying, yeah there you go yeah this has been weird. yeah so it's even longer it's even longer yeah yeah i think for me actually it was um january 16th or the 18th it was somewhere around there that i beat uncharted 4 so mm. Not too long ago in retrospect, but it just seems like weeks ago at this point, just because I've been busy with some other stuff. Well, why don't we why don't we start with you? Like, first of all, I want to know, like, what brought you to firing that particular game up? Yeah, it's a really good question. So I forget what weekend it was. I think it was a weekend or it was a Friday that I was like, all right, you know, I, I need to, like, just sit down and, and hunker down with a game once and for all and just kind of play this thing properly. So uh, with no BS aside and, and no kind of uh, reasons as to why I couldn't play a game, I, I realized that I, I had no excuses anymore. So mm. for whatever reason, I was dabbling around with some really kind of weird games like Persona 5 and Gravity Rush and some kind of obscure stuff. Um, and I was even asking Joe, like, hey, man, like, what should I play? I'm kind of craving this. And I kind of put some of those cravings aside. And I just thought to myself, you know what? Um, let me go back further and mm. deal with something that I own instead of trying to acquire a new game. Right. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it, dude. I, I'm going to play Uncharted 4. I, I want to play something that's a little bit more linear, a little bit more structured, mm -hmm. uh, something that you know I've been kind of pressing about on the show for a little bit in terms of what I want to see this year and, and moving forward in games. So I grabbed Uncharted 4. I have a physical copy. Uh, it's actually the limited edition Steelbook nice. uh, case, which is kind of interesting. And I even had like a... <laughs> A Nathan Drake statue, which I eventually sold. But mm. long story short, that is the game I chose. And I literally did the unthinkable coming from our world of gaming, which is to just take the game, put it in the disk drive, and play the shit out of it and beat it. <laughs> and yeah, I know it sounds so crazy to, to think about this a video game podcast, but uh, everybody knows that we struggle to beat games sometimes. Mm. But that was the game of choice. And uh, man, do I not regret doing this. Um, what an amazing, amazing, amazing gaming experience. I don't think I've ever had such a, a grandeur gaming experience ever before. And I know that's a really bold statement, but when I thought about it more, I don't know if it's my favorite game of all time because mm. coming off of the high of beating it, I was like, man, this is the best game mm. ever. I remember using and those words, think, yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't want to take it back, but I think a, a better way to kind of reframe that is to say that it's the best gaming experience I've ever had. Okay. Um, or the best experience I've ever had in a game. I mean, really kind of two ways of saying it. But mm. the reason why I say that is just because typically this kind of game is not really what I would hold to a high regard in terms of like, these are the kind of games I play, like action adventure mm -hmm. with like kind of this cheeky protagonist. Um, but it worked out, man. And I, I really enjoyed one through two. <laughs> I never beat three. Mm. Um, I played some of three, but you know, one and two were just amazing experiences that I had many, many moons ago when the, when the PS3 was still prevalent. Um, but yeah, moving to four, man, uh, I had played it. I had played probably about like maybe two hours again, years ago, probably 2016, I think is when it came out. Mm. So shortly after it came out, I played a couple hours and I just, I put it down. I, I don't know if I got bored with it, something Something happened. I got distracted as usual. Um, but yeah, <laughs> this time I stuck with it. Yeah. And, um, you know, here's the thing, man, like just kind of initial thoughts. I think it's safe to say that everyone has kind of this Indiana Jones fantasy inside of them. Um, you know, how could you not? How, how could you not want to be an explorer? It's 
some point in your life or, um, you know, experience uh, traveling the world for some sort of ancient treasure. Yeah. It's almost impossible to resist the urge to want to do that or to even be mildly interested in that sort of concept. Mm -hmm. um, so even though Indiana Jones is kind of a, an older uh, movie series, it's still something that we always remember. And I think uh, whether you're a man or a woman, there's always an adventure inside of you. And I think uh, that's what makes these games really special. And yeah. certainly with four. Yeah, I mean, like anybody that was born uh, in the 80s, you know, likely grew up watching the Indiana Jones films. And just that mystique of, of the unknown and that uh, that quick wit of Harrison Ford <laughs> mm -hmm. just made the, the whole idea of treasure hunting so charming and romantic sounding. And, yes. uh, and you know, man, I wanted to be him. Yeah, well, hey, I mean, you said it best. That's that's pretty much Nathan Drake in a nutshell. It's right. like they kind of sort of, I wouldn't say copied that idea, but they certainly probably used it as like, a, you know, a way to kind of influence the character of Nathan mm. and to kind of, you know, bounce ideas, of, you know, between the movie series and what they were trying to create. But um, yeah, um, absolute masterpiece. And um, I really think what makes that kind of bold statement easy to for me to say is because every single aspect of the game, you know, when you kind of break down a game review with categories, mm -hmm. everything to me was a 10 out of 10 from gameplay to sound mechanics, every single thing I really couldn't find a flaw with. So at that point, when I had set the controller down and the credits were rolling at the end of the game, I really was actually uttering to myself, like, this is the best game I've ever fucking played. <laughs> it's just that simple. And I remember Lauren came over and she's like, are you talking to yourself? And I'm like, maybe, maybe not. Maybe fuck yourself. Um, I, I didn't tell her that. <laughs> Good idea. But I was like, I was like, just give me a minute. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, but I had a moment and I was like, damn, dude, like not only did it feel good to just sit down and beat a game and, and yeah. do it swiftly and in a short amount of time, um, but to experience something so profoundly uh, compelling right. was just a really refreshing feeling for me to have. And I think um, the story is just so interesting and the gameplay is orchestrated so well mm -hmm. that you forget about the pacing because the pacing is not only good, but everything just ends up blending together and you're, you're very quickly lost in a good way into this movie. You're, you're essentially controlling this blockbuster Indiana Jones movie with this incredibly engaging story and these really, um, you know, compelling characters that you have so much emotional depth with yeah. so quickly too. So early on, you're just attached to Elena, Nate's wife and, and not only Nate, but, his brother Sam and then Sully and everybody just warms up to you so quickly. And I think for anybody that's entering the series and they're starting with four mm. would probably still have that same effect. Like you don't have to play one through three to really understand everything that's going on with four. And I think that was another thing that set it apart is like, it's really accessible for somebody that's new to the series. Yeah. I mean, I think the games, I mean, I've only played one and two extensively. Um, I have three and four waiting for me. And hearing you talk about these games so passionately really kind of gives me that itch to go through and play through them. But I definitely got that vibe from those games that, like, you can jump in anywhere you want, but it's not necessarily going to lead to the best experience. You know, they set up that that sequel like you get from a movie, right? Like, you kind of, uh, you can jump in the middle and they'll give you enough backstory to kind of figure it out. But if you really want the best experience, then it, it's worth the time to going through everything. Would you agree with that? I would agree. You know, if if you've been lucky to play one through three, it's definitely going to jive perhaps a little bit better. Yeah. Um, but again, it, it is nice to have it be accessible to somebody that's new. So mm. for me, that wasn't a huge point. It was just a point that I think is worth noting mm -hmm. um, for, for folks that are going to listen to this and think, you know, where do I start? I would still suggest starting with one. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the patience to kind of go through that, you're fine with starting with four. They're fairly short games, too. So it's it's not a terrible uh, time investment, at least, you know. Yeah, no, and that's true. Um, I'm almost wrapping up three. And that one, I think, is about nine hours. Mm -hmm. But this one has got to be the longest. I think it clocks in at about 15 to 16. I would really? say actually 15 to 18 yeah depending on um, how well you're doing, quite frankly, because there are puzzles that you can get stuck on. There are areas that you might want to explore a little bit more. And if you're hunting for treasures and kind of going that completionist route, yeah, I would say refer to, you know, how long to beat 
and you'll probably find that it's you know closer to 20 or 20 plus mm -hmm. if you were to go um you know no stone you know left unturned kind of route uh, back to the uh, Twitch chat for just a moment. Killer Sirac notes that Lost Legacy is worth a playthrough as well. Uh, interestingly enough, um, you have recently played that as well, haven't you? I did. It was uh, <laughs> immediately after. I was like, you know what? I got to play this um, because I just was craving more when I was done with 4. And mm. the Lost Legacy came out, I want to say, a year or two after 4. And um, brilliant, brilliant game. I mean, that's something I'm going to talk about on a, on a different episode. But yeah, uh, the quality was still there and, and a tremendous experience. Excellent. So let's dive into the, like the nitty gritty of this, man. Tell me about this game. Yeah. Um, why don't we start with gameplay? Okay. Um, basically, the gameplay here is largely the same as what you would find in one through three. Um, it's a lot of puzzles, a lot of shootouts, um, a lot of just sort of general exploration and a ton of climbing, of course, because mm -hmm. that's pretty much it's one what of your does. biggest. Uh, ex it's what he does. And yeah. he's an expert at it. And there are still moments in the game where like there's no way that like anybody could do that um, that easily. Mm -hmm. But that's the charm of the game. You know, it's not meant to be ultra realistic in, in that sense of, of climbing. And there isn't, you know, in the real world, like magically just these bricks jutting out of a wall <laughs> perfectly <laughs> like lined up so you can climb this building when there's no other like door to open. But yeah. that's again, that's what makes the game so endearing and you have to still figure it out and there are definitely times where i i didn't know where to go and i'm like shit man do i have to look this up and i was like no we're not going to do that with this game you're going to figure it out mm. and i'm glad i did i glad i didn't look anything up because sometimes you just have to like literally look up or look down or look to left or right and you will find a little ledge that might be a little um you know kind of out of the way or maybe kind of in darkness and you weren't able to see it well but once you find it it's so much more rewarding knowing yeah. that you did it on your own so I Overall, uh, same kind of Uncharted stuff that you would expect, just done better. Mm. Uh, so, for example, with the enemies, you can now mark them, uh, similar to what you could do in, say, Battlefield or Metal Gear Solid. So you can put, like, a little white arrow above their head. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of helps you um, kind of stay in contact with where they are. And I don't believe that that was um, possible in 1 through 3. In fact, I'm pretty, like, 99.9% .9 sure it wasn't possible. Yeah, so I, I couldn't tell you. Really nice feature. Yeah. So there's that. Um, there's less puzzles, which I thought was kind of refreshing. Some of the puzzles in one through three are actually kind of mind bending um, and to the point of frustration. I actually dealt with some recently in three that I was like, God damn it, I cannot do this. <laughs> I had to look one up. Uh, luckily, it was only one. Yeah. But with four, I didn't have to look any up. I, you really do have to think sometimes, though, outside of the box, um, quite literally in some cases. And you just have to use your journal. Um, that you break out often to kind of solve those puzzles and you got to look at the notes that he's taking mm. and then again just use like common sense and sometimes you have to go outside of common sense to figure it out but i think having those puzzles still there and perhaps a little bit less was nice because they are a little bit more frequent i think in in two and three from what i can remember mm -hmm. and um, sometimes it gets a little annoying when you get into like a dungeon area and you're just like there's going to be a fucking puzzle coming up and I don't really want to do one. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like what you said about Fallen Order, right? Like there were some moments where you, all you had to do in the end was just hit something with your lightsaber. But yeah. the whole time you were thinking that it was something way bigger than that. Right. So um, overall, man, I would say like when you combine all of those aspects of Uncharted and you mix them together in four, they're just balanced better. Okay. And I think that's really what sets it apart from the previous three games is like, I mean, hey, some of the shootouts can still be really fury inducing. Like I've definitely had moments where I'm like, I'm going to fucking break this controller. I'm going to throw it against this brick wall right above this fireplace right here that we never use. And I'm going to go out and buy another 60 or $70 controller. And I'm not going to care because I fucking hate this game. Mm. So I had a couple moments like that in shootouts, but it's way better now that you can mark people because in one through three, you can't mark them. So you would have like moments where like, you're almost done with the shootout, you're low on health, you're trying to recover, and then you get somebody that comes up behind you and blasts you with a shotgun. Okay. And you're like, I'm gonna I'm gonna break this goddamn controller. <laughs> so that happens a lot less in four. That's good. Um and as far as the exploration, I, I think that that might be one of the best aspects of the game. I mean, standing on a ledge or a high point is just more times than not, just wildly breathtaking, man. Mm. I mean, the game takes place in in Scotland, in Italy and most uh, most importantly, Madagascar. And uh, it's just insanely beautiful. And, and what they were able to achieve 
with PS4's hardware is just beyond belief, man. I, I, I know I said this about some other games before, like Shadow of the Colossus looking really tip top. But I mean, this is just top tier graphics, man. I mean, Naughty yeah. Dog might be like potentially the best studio out there when it comes to like putting out solid visuals that are just jaw dropping. Um, and again, I'm not even playing this on 4K. I'm not playing it on a pro. I'm not sure if it's pro compatible. Right. Um, I'm sure it is. And if it is, well, then all I can say is, God damn, brace yourself. <laughs> brace no- yourselves. Because what I experienced was just, it was unreal, man. Naughty Naughty Dog, I think, has the PlayStation architecture, like, just mastered, you know. They do. There really is no other developer like them that has put out consistently uh, the quality of graphics that they have for that system. Um, not, mm-hmm. to, not to say that there it aren't shows. other uh, developers that do as good or better, but their track record, I think, is more uh, thorough than, than yes. you know. Um, say the developers of Horizon or the developers of uh, Spider-Man or, you know, just just throwing out some of the top games from last generation. Yeah. And, you know, to kind of jump off of the the PlayStation bandwagon, um, I would say almost any exclusive, right, generally looks really, really good. Right. They're, they're always like at that sort of top tier quality in terms of visuals um, that you understand. And you the more you think about it, you're like, all right, you know, I'm dipping my toes into like exclusive category now Mm -hmm. and exclusive like games that like literally make the PlayStation that make the Xbox. Right. So when you fire up, you know, a Halo exclusive, you know, of course it's going to look amazing. Um, So I had that in mind and I was like, you know what? I shouldn't be too surprised, but even still just the the quality of mocap and and what they were able to achieve Mm -hmm. in the sort of facial expressions. um, It's unlike anything I've ever seen. Yeah, which I guess brings us to visuals. Yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, these are the best I've ever seen in any video game ever. Uh, again, a really bold statement and, and certainly debatable, of course. But I would argue that if you were to fire up this game and you've never experienced before, you're going to be blown away. Um, there are games that definitely are on par with it, but there's just certain achievements, I think, that they um, that they made with 4 that are just unmatched, at least from what I've seen. Uh, like I said, the the characters' faces and the mocap work is just exceptional. Mm. Um, I've never seen game faces and more importantly facial animations that look this right. Uh, I think it's really hard to to get correct. Like I mean, if you look at Mass Effect and other games, you know that do it fairly well. Sometimes you still get that sort of like cold dead eye effect yeah. where they don't look alive on the inside. Mm-hmm. Um, you get weird teeth. I think everybody has seen some weird teeth because teeth is, are really hard to get right in a video game. Yep. Um, but with Uncharted 4, I, I think it's just because of the quality of the cameras, the quality of the mocap that they're doing. And man, um, there's there's tons of videos. If you go on YouTube, there's a bunch of videos of like the making of Uncharted 4 and for good reason, because I think after people experienced that game, they were like, how the hell did they pull this off? Right. Because it's just that good. And like the... It, it looks real. There were times where Lauren came over and she was like, this legit looks like a movie that you're, mm. that you're playing. That was an ad campaign that they used for the second game. Like that very conversation you just had with Lauren, that was an actual advertising campaign. Do you remember that? I don't know. I, I will have to try to dig up some of the videos on uh, YouTube, but the, for, for uncharted Two, the advertisements on television were like, this game is so amazing looking. Your girlfriend is going to think it's an actual movie. Not yeah, making this yeah. up, man. <laughs> no, I, I totally believe it. It's funny you mention that because if you go on my YouTube back in the archives, I actually have um, some older videos of me mm-hmm. like shooting off screen, like visuals from Uncharted 2. Mm-hmm. And as like the cheesiest like title, I put like Uncharted 2 graphics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's just like videos of, of me with my iPhone, like shooting the game off screen because I was so impressed with it mm-hmm. at the time. Um, and going back to three, it certainly looks good, especially with the Nathan Drake collection. Yeah. Um, thank blue point for that, but just not even comparable, uh, from three to four. It is just a massive leap, um, in every department. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Um, you played, uh, the last of us part one. How do you think that that game graphically fares compared to uncharted four? It's definitely up there. Um, I would still argue that 4 is better. Mm. It's a newer uh, game, so... It is. Um, and I would still say it's better because I think they put more 
more emphasis and perhaps more time on that because Nathan Drake is like literally like a PlayStation figure, right? Like every, mm-hmm. everybody knows who he is. So I think they put a little bit more love into that. Mm-hmm. However, with Joel and Ellie, I mean, it's still incredible what they were able to achieve there, even in the PS3 version. Yeah. Which a lot of people forget it was a PS3 game. Right, initially. right. Yeah. Um, you're talking about uh, Last of Us, not not Uncharted 4, right? Last of Us. Yeah, okay. Just to clarify. Uh, Killer Rock yep. is throwing a uh, link to the um, YouTube video in our Perfect. Discord room. So uh, swing out by our Discord room. Uh, it's a good opportunity to plug that. <laughs> swing out by our Discord room for that link if you'd like to check it out. Um. <sighs> I had something about gameplay that I wanted to ask you. Um, sure. Can you tell me about the mechanics as far as like um, your guns, um, how shooting feels? How does your character heal? Um, is there any crafting elements? Uh, you know, all those nitty gritty details. Sure. Um, I would say not much has changed. I would say that it's all just been tweaked and improved to mm-hmm. be to be and kind of feel better. So you're still playing that game of like when you run out of ammo, you got to switch to your regular firearm, like your pistol. Or if you're completely out, you have to run over enemies' bodies and like hit triangle to pick up more bullets or a different gun. Mm-hmm. So that is all still the same. Um, but you can now switch over the shoulder for shooting, which is a nice nice concept to have. I think you just hit X and you can you know, aim over whatever shoulder you want, depending on the angle that you're at mm-hmm. or uh, whatever crevice or corner you're behind. So that was helpful. Um, it's more realistic in terms of like sway and recoil. Uh, I would say there's more guns, a lot of familiar guns that you would find in the the older games. Like there's grenade launchers, there's RPGs. So a lot of that stuff still exists. There's Mm -hmm. no crafting. Um, this is still very much like pick up and shoot kind of concept, which I think they really nailed in, in the first three. And I can see why they didn't want to stray away from that because part of the thrill is, having to kind of like get out of cover, go and pick up more ammo or a different gun and then run back to cover again or find a new point of cover. Okay. And I think that adds to the actual gameplay of what you're doing with Nate, which is a lot of like cover shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, you have blind fire, which I don't know if that was in existence in the first three. So you can now like literally blind fire over like a little ledge or like a little like retaining wall, which is mm-hmm. kind of cool. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that changed there. Not really, man. They they didn't kind of uh, fix what wasn't broken, if that makes sense. Sure. And as far as like health and, and healing and things like that? Yeah, health and healing is the same. So what will happen is when you get really severely injured, you'll see kind of like blood effects kind of start ingraining like different aspects of the screen, top, bottom, all the way around pretty much. And then you know that it's time to get behind cover. So I think Last of Us had a similar concept where the mm. screen would kind of go black and white. Yes, that still happens. And when that happens, you basically just get behind cover. You wait, I don't know, like five to five to 10 seconds and you start, uh, you know, kind of rejuvenating your health back. Gotcha. So there's no like um, there's no health kits per se. It's just you automatically. No health kits. Okay. Yep. Automatically heal. Keeping it basic. Yep. Keeping it basic. I want to say that, excuse me, there might have been a couple of times where I fell off of a ledge or I got wounded and I was walking differently. I, I might be entirely making this up, <laughs> um, but I, I could have sworn that something like that was happening. Um, if I'm wrong about that, which is quite possible, then then nothing happens. Then you just kind of, you might have like a few more scars or a few more like right. cuts or scrapes or whatever that will start um, kind of appearing on you. And then they eventually fade. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. So yeah, go on. Not, not a whole lot different. Excellent. Excellent. Um, let's talk about sound and music. Sure. So uh, sound and music I separated because they're, they're very different. Mm-hmm. Um, moving on to sound, I, I primarily played with headphones, um, occasionally off the sound bar, depending on whether or not Lauren was home or what, whatever she was doing. Um, they were both really impressive, but ultimately it always comes down to headphones being the best, at least for me. Uh, you know, having that surround experience in a, in a pair of cans, <clears throat> is just kind of unbeatable. Hmm. Um, and with what they were able to achieve with wind and foliage kind of moving around and waterfalls and just basically creating like this true sense of environment, wherever you were, whether it was in a cave or in water or in Italy, like outside of a, a mansion mm-hmm. 
they were able to create a lot of really interesting sound effects that um, are really kind of immersive. Uh, mm -hmm. Unlike any other game I think I've experienced, like they used a special technology. I forget what it was called. I read it on the Wikipedia, but it, they used some sort of immersion technique where they recorded a lot of sounds like live, okay. like actually went to some of these places and recorded them versus using like sound bites or whatever. And uh, it shows. Um, what's also kind of really unique is they, I think Naughty Dog as a whole, if they've kind of figured out how to get characters to speak to each other really well. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by this is like, for example, like when you run off and you have a partner with you and you're kind of like off in a cave and they're kind of straggling behind, they're doing something else. If they go to say something to you, it'll sound as though they're really far away, like they're distant, but they figured out a way to make it sound really <clears throat> faint, but you still understand it. Okay. It's very hard to describe, but there's a special, I don't know, like way that they've designed this sound to make it so realistic that you don't ever miss what they're saying. And there were times where like Sam's voice was so quiet that I, th I thought that I was going to, you know, not be able to understand what he was trying to tell me. Mm. But every mm. single time I was still able to understand it. And I don't know how they pulled that off. Mm -hmm. but they did. And I, I found that to be really impressive. And it's one of those things that you kind of have to experience for it to make more sense rather than just kind of listening to me waffle on about it, mm -hmm. but just incredible sound design overall. Um, and you hear a lot of nature and shit too. Like you'll, you'll hear like parrots and um, elephants and just fucking everything, nice. sand blowing in the wind, the sound of mud, like kicking off the tires, like when you're in the Jeep and you're trying to navigate up like a muddy hill, mm -hmm. everything, the attention to detail is just off the charts. Hmm. That's awesome. It's just stunning, man. It's like, this is what I was saying, like the beginning of the review, like every single aspect, every category that you would break down a game with is just amazing. Like, I, I don't <laughs> know how they did it. Like, I really don't understand how I've been able to play a game that's essentially perfect. Yeah. Um, as far as music, this one's kind of tough. So it's good, right? Like you have the theme that everybody has probably heard before um, that's always enchanting, always kind of like gets you kind of fired up. Right. But ultimately, I think it was the use of the music and the placement of the music, depending on what you were doing, whether you're sneaking in a mansion or you're going back in time and you're doing something when you're a kid with your brother, Sam. We're going to have to talk about story after this the way that they would queue up the music was just so fitting for every instance that you were placed in. And um, I think that's really what shined. It wasn't so much like the themes. I mean, the themes are great, like I mentioned, but it's, it's the timing and the placement mm. of, of the music that really set it apart from other games that kind of just fill, yep. uh, put a lot of like, you know, filler music in just to kind of get music in. And yeah. sometimes it doesn't always fit that well. That's a pet peeve of mine, both in gaming and in television or movies. Like, I just, man, I've watched, I've stopped watching shows because of their constant use of a soundtrack. Like sometimes mm -hmm. there just doesn't need to be music. Just let the audio of the actors and their surroundings do what they're supposed to do. You don't need music constantly. Yeah. I couldn't agree with that more, man. Yeah. Not to go off topic, but yeah. Lauren watches a bunch of like, in my opinion, crappy shows. <laughs> and uh, a lot of those shows contain so much filler music yeah. and some of it's so out of place and so overly used that it's almost mm -hmm. like she's watching a goddamn music video. Yeah. And that's why I love shows like House of the Cards and shit like that because they use very subtle notes yeah. and, and really nice, like kind of eerie, mysterious, like drama music. And mm -hmm. it's, it's fitting. And when you come across a show or a game that, that does that so well, yeah. It changes the experience entirely. Not to go off on a complete tangent, but I'm going <laughs> to. Um, Do it. Dave, uh, epic outro in the uh, Twitch chat, uh, name drop Star Trek Discovery. And that is something that I have complained about to him in great length. <laughs> um, <laughs> because that show, um, you know, I can get into a whole thing about that and I won't. But uh, they're one of those shows that uses music nonstop. And I actually watched an episode of Discovery and then immediately followed it up with an episode of The Expanse. And it was like night and day with the mm -hmm. way the, the music was used. Um, the Expanse, like I remember there was this one scene where a character just walked into the room and there was no music. And it like hit me like a ton of bricks. It's like, wow, 
they trust their actors they trust their environment they trust their mm-hmm. audio team to use sound effects that are appropriate and they don't need a composer to cover their tracks i literally stopped watching doctor who because of that the soundtrack was constant and too loud and i couldn't hear the dialogue and the show kind of was starting to go downhill anyway in my opinion and i was just like the the soundtrack was the last last straw i'm like I, this is not worth it yeah well i'll tell you what man there was a time and place for that and that's like dawson's creek you know it's like <laughs> old shows sitcoms and you know dramas and shit yeah all that shit dude. Yeah. <laughs> i gotta sound i gotta say that song is pretty catchy it is it is <laughs> it kind of is dude it kind of is you kind of just want to belt it out in the shower like oh alone. man Especially like if you're having like a really dumpy day and there's like no sun out, <laughs> it's like overcast and you're just like, I don't want to wait <laughs> with your like little sudsy pink loofah. Oh God. That's a oh, throwback. If That's I start a throwback for the the veteran listeners. If I, if I start belting that out, Nikki might like bust in the room and like, it just like start and join you. you. She'll join me. She will join with me. a hairbrush. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, oh, we're going to do this? No problem. Be uh, right back. Comes back with a giant hairbrush. Oh, man. Um, but, uh, yeah, just for the sake of time. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, my God. Uh, is it James Vanderbeek? Yeah, yes. I think that's the main, yes. main character. Yep. Um, man. Uh, story. Okay? Yes. Nice segue. Story. Go on. <laughs> so, here, here's the deal. Oh, God, I can't get it out of my head. Um <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ. So (laughs) as Nathan, right? Yes. You're essentially retired. Um, I will say that the game kind of opens up with uh, you're in your attic. Mm -hmm. And if I remember this correctly, you're in your attic and you're playing with like Nerf guns and you're going through all your old treasures and findings from all of your adventures uh, in the past. And you're kind of reminiscing alone in your attic. Mm -hmm. Elena, your wife is downstairs and she's cooking dinner. And... It's so fucking charming, man, the way they, they kind of start the game, you know, with this particular sequence, because you really are, it's setting the stage for this retired life that Nathan finds himself in, because mm-hmm. he's essentially retired. He works for um, kind of like this uh, shipyard, basically, where they, um, he's he kind of helps out with underwater jobs and, and shit like that. Um, think maybe like underwater welding and like moving some like shit from underneath the water, like with help of a crane and Mm -hmm. it's a real business. Right. But it allows him to still kind of do some like exploration type stuff at work. But at the end of the day, he's in an office half the time he's stamping papers and he's kind of bored. Right. And you start gearing up for this idea like, okay, Nate's retired. He's just reminiscing in his attic. He works for the shipyard. Mm -hmm. You know, damn well that, there's going to be a generic story that's going to unfold and he's going to get ripped out of this retirement. Mm -hmm. He's going to go back into the field again. And that's exactly what happens. Um, Your brother, Sam, who you think is long lost or dead, comes back mysteriously from jail, finds you and basically says, Hey, like I'm in deep shit with basically like the mob essentially without Mm -hmm. revealing too much. Mm -hmm. And I need to find this ancient pirate treasure. Um, and if I can't find it, I'm dead, basically. So really simple premise. Nate's like, oh, you know what? I, I can't do this anymore. I'm retired. I don't do that shit. Mm-hmm. This is not This is not okay. I can't do this. So needless to say, Sam talks him into it. You travel to Italy. You go to Scotland and eventually Madagascar. And you're in search of this, this pirate treasure. Um, the pirate's name is Henry Avery. So he's an ancient pirate. I don't know if he actually was real or thought to be real, but... Um, again, super simple premise, nothing too crazy. And, um, that's, that's really the story in a nutshell in terms of like what you're, you're seeking to do. Mm -hmm. And there's other things I want to say, but again, I really don't want to say them because it would truly ruin the story. Mm -hmm. And some of them are not even really spoilers. They're just kind of like plot points. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm going to save that and just kind of move on to, I suppose like the narrative and the voice acting um, that's delivered throughout this story. I I think it's worth noting because those two aspects is, is really what I found to kind of keep me myself like engaged the whole time. Mm. Um, What I mean by this is like, it's so good that you don't want to put the controller down. You don't want to stop playing. You want to know where the story goes constantly because it's that 
well told. Mm -hmm. And it's such a simple premise, like I already, already told you, like it's just two brothers going to find this pirate treasure. But because it's told so well, and because the voice acting is so good and the pacing is so good with the dialogue, even when you're running around, because there's a lot of chatter between you and Sam and other characters, you, you just don't want to stop. And I think that was another reason why I was able to complete this game in such a short amount of time. Um, and that really doesn't occur with me that often at all. Right. Um, there's a lot, a lot of emotional depth that I have never experienced before. Um, and just like I said before, it's like experiencing a movie that you're, that you're controlling. And you can even create open uh, dialogue. Like you'll see like a little triangle appear above Sam's head if he has something else to say and you tap triangle and he might continue the conversation. Hmm. So there's a lot of story that's told through gameplay and then a lot of it's told through cutscenes, but it's balanced again so perfectly that there's never a point where you're like, oh my God, like gameplay again or oh my God, cutscenes again. Nice. It's just perfectly balanced. Um, and I sort of also found myself rooting for every character um from sully to sam to elena to nate to almost everybody except for rafe the the villain mm. um you become so invested in in their motives and just kind of their whole character development that it just creates this sense of attachment man that i really again have not experienced in any other game and it's a huge factor as to why this game ended up getting a 10 out of 10. Mm. excellent and excellent. i think i might wrap it there man because I don't want to go on too long and we have another game review, but yeah. ultimately that is the short version of why <laughs> I think Uncharted 4, A Thief's End, is the best gaming experience I've ever had. Those are uh, very, very uh, bold but definitive words, man. Mm. I hope so, man. I, like I said, I, I find it hard doing these reviews sometimes. I, I prefer writing because I can kind of think of more, but I hope that for anybody listening that has never <clears> played this game, I hope that I've implanted some uh, some interest somehow and somewhere for you to at least try it. Excellent. Very nice, man. I mean, I, I certainly am inspired to play it. Um, you know, I've been kind of thinking about swinging back to the PlayStation for a while. Excuse mm. me. And um, I got sidetracked by something else. That's a whole nother conversation. But uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you know, I just had this like burning desire to try to put a pin in uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. And I really would like to spend some time with um, Uncharted three and four. Uh, I never actually finished two, so I figure at this point I might as well just go through the whole the whole series. And I do you, have you probably should. Yeah, I mean I have the Uncharted collection. I don't know if that includes Lost Legacy, but I'm pretty sure it includes it does not. one through four, doesn't it? One through three, four is a separate game. Is it okay? Well, Same with Lost Legacy. I'm sure I can grab it on sale cheap enough though at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, probably like six or seven bucks, I would imagine. Yeah, I would too. So that that's a goal of mine at some point in this year to try to revisit those games. Yeah, I think that's a, a really realistic undertaking as well, yeah. considering the length of them. Yeah, well, I mean, like, you just out of nowhere, like, oh, yeah, I uh, beat Uncharted 4 this weekend. I'm like, what the fuck? When did you even start? <laughs> yeah, n not exactly a short game, you know. I, yeah. We're used to beating kind of quick games here and there, especially in that kind of time period. But mm -hmm. to beat a AAA game, that quickly i was i was uh definitely patting myself on the back for that one nice nice um all right well i guess it's my turn at this point right uh <laughs> i'm fucking thrilled for this one then yeah man um hopefully i can i can follow up your excellent review with uh something that you know is somewhat comparable uh star wars jedi fallen order um i finished this game so i started playing this when the series x actually came out because it was uh, released for game pass and um i do want to note that i beat the game before the upgrade came out for the new consoles um, okay electronic arts has released a patch for uh, series x and series s that is supposed to take advantage of the hardware capabilities of both systems um, my understanding is uh, it's worth checking out uh, but I have not had the time or an opportunity to do so. So I'm going off of uh, my experience on the Series X prior to that patch. And I have to say it was still pretty positive. Um, this is a game that had a bit of a rocky launch uh, when it came out. And there were some issues with bugs and glitches. And, you know, uh, I remember seeing some of the footage where, like, characters that you were fighting would just kind of teleport away. Nothing to the same degree of cyberpunk, but, you know, definitely some humorous stuff that's, uh, if you look it up on YouTube, I'm sure you'll find some pretty entertaining things. Um, I 
fortunately did not have uh, any experiences like that. There were a couple glitches where maybe something got stuck in a wall or, you know, maybe, uh, you know, somebody that should have seen me didn't, but nothing, nothing I would consider game breaking. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I may have had to reload a save once or twice tops. Okay. Um, not terrible. The load times on the game were fair. I would say um, I believe that they certainly took advantage of the series X horsepower. I did try it on my one X at one point or another. And I found that uh, the game did run faster on the series X, um, but they both looked about the same. You know, the only advantage that I had on that was playing it on a 4k TV with my series X. And um, okay. you know, with, with the performance talk out of the way, uh, let's like dive into the game proper. It, you know, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order for anybody who has not played it is a third person uh, action adventure game. A lot of people compare it to Dark Souls and that ilk. Um, and I can understand why, uh, but it is certainly not uh, nearly at the same difficulty of uh, those sorts of games. You know, this is, I would, I don't want to call it Dark Souls light, but I suppose that might be a good way to put it. Um, okay. You know, uh, from from some of the articles I was reading, uh, they were saying that actually uh, Batman Arkham Asylum was an inspiration for the gameplay for this. I don't know if that's true or mm. not. Um, but this also has elements of Metroidvania type games as well, too, where there's certain areas that maybe as you're exploring, you come across and uh, you just can't get there, you know, quite quite yet you don't have the powers that you need necessarily to make that jump across that bridge or to knock this wall down or unlock this door and you make a little mental note and you're like all right i'll circle back to this later on um as, as the story goes you play as a jedi padawan named cal kestis who is played by cameron monahan he's most famous for the show shameless which is uh, entering in, or it's in its final season right now he's one of the lead characters on that show um, I don't think I knew that. Yeah, yeah. Everybody in this show, or excuse me, everybody in this game um, is, uh, with the exception of the aliens, of course, uh, they mocap their faces. And um, his face, like, and his voice immediately jumped out. Nikki was in the room with me. She watches Shameless. And she immediately saw him, and she's like, oh, yeah, he's in Shameless. Didn't miss a beat, right? And then later on, um, you'll run into Forrest Whitaker and <laughs> i love him looks like him sounds like him you know it's like it's unmistakable even uh deborah wilson who plays seer who won a uh, drewy a couple weeks ago um <laughs> you know like i was i was struggling trying to figure out who it was because the actress sounded familiar and looked so familiar and sure enough it did some research and you know figured out who it was mm -hmm. um but anyway um cal is essentially dealing with not only imperial forces but uh, as you go from planet to planet, you're dealing with aggressive animal species as well. And they're all particular to whatever planet you're, uh, you're on. So you won't really encounter the same enemy on uh, more than one planet outside of Imperial you know, Stormtroopers and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And through the game, you start to earn skill points. Uh, you have an XP bar that you're filling up that fills up with every kill that you get. Um, you could also uh, level up your character through acquiring items. There are uh, these hidden crates that are scattered about each uh, level or each planet. And um, some of them you can unlock uh, bonuses. So like if you, uh, you know, get a, a three um, green <laughs> crates, so to speak, uh, it'll give you a boost in health. There's a blue one that'll help boost your, your force powers. All those items give you XP because you found them and, uh, you know, that gives you that that extra boost. Um, I don't believe there was a actual like level cap per se. They don't really track what level you're on. You just get experience points and you have an opportunity to spend them in a skill tree. OK, OK. The, the skill tree does have some sections that are gated off at the beginning um, and they're tied to story events. So you have uh, something like a double jump, for example, which will enable you to jump higher or further than you could before, maybe reach areas that you couldn't get to. Um, that's tied to a story event or um, rekindling some of your Jedi powers like force push, force pull. Those are also tied to story events as well. And once you activate those powers in that story, part of the skill tree opens up 
and you have the ability to start investing experience points into those skills. So maybe it's something as simple as making it stronger. Maybe it's being able to use force pull on more than one enemy at a time um, or push more than one enemy off of a cliff. Um, you can start using them in tandem with each other. Your character gets pretty powerful as the game progresses. Um, and all of these require something called force energy, which is uh, kind of in tandem with your life bar. It's a, a blue bar that degrades as you use these force powers. And uh, you can acquire pickups to kind of replenish it, or uh, you can meditate at something they call a meditation circle. And oh, cool. You'll find these scattered throughout the, the world. There's one on your ship as well. And the meditation circle, once you've kind of you come up to it, your character actually kneels and everything that's around him kind of fades away. And he's just in this like dark blue kind of void. Right. And in front mm -hmm. of in front of you is the skill tree. And it's almost kind of reminds me of um, like sand art, you know, like the um, I guess it's Buddhist meditation sand. I, I OK, that sort of thing. Right. It kind of reminds you me have of me that. at that, man. <laughs> Hey, help me at that. I want to play this goddamn game now. <laughs> well, there's a lot of reasons to play the game, man. Um, well, that that's more than enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Easy sell. <laughs> Buddhist sand art. <laughs> that's it. Episode title done. Uh, <laughs> so, when you when you kneel down, um, you're given the option to check out the skill tree where you can take a look at some of the items that you or some of the skills that you've unlocked. It'll play a little clip and showing you how to use that power. Um, and then you can also rest. And when you rest, what happens is all of the enemies in the immediate area that you've killed, they respawn. So it gives you this kind of, uh, pro con kind of situation, risk versus reward, because mm -hmm. when you rest, you heal, your health goes to full percent, you know, hundred percent, your force energy goes to hundred percent, but everything you killed around you is now respawned and back alive again. And most of them are really angry. So <laughs> are you powerful enough to deal with that? Are you powerful enough to skip the, the resting portion of the meditation? Because that's also a safe point too. So you can just duck into the meditation circle, save your game without resting and then leave. And none of those enemies will have respawned or mm. you can, respawn the enemies and get the experience and kind of farm the area. Okay. Um, so there's kind of that risk versus reward cycle that I think um, a lot of these types of games have, right? Um, let's see here. There's a lot of hidden items in the game, a lot of collectibles. They tend to be mostly disappointing. Um, most of the I want to hear about the ponchos. Yes. So um, your character uh, can change his poncho. He could change his outfit um, to some degree. You could change your lightsaber. They have a whole lightsaber customization section. And all of these parts are acquired by finding chess. And when I play a game like this, I personally am looking forward to trying to find as many of these chests as possible because I am like a collectathon whore, right? But I expect to be rewarded in kind. And for the most part, it was a very disappointing experience. You unlock a chest that's high up on a mountain. It took you 20 minutes to get to and three fucking tiers of skills to get to. And it ends up being a goddamn poncho that doesn't even look good. It does nothing. <laughs> it, it does not offer any kind of skill bonuses. It doesn't make you jump higher. It doesn't make you faster. It doesn't do shit. So... So it's just a poncho it, for the sake of being a poncho. It's just a poncho for the sake of being a poncho. There are Damn. there are uh, other unlockables that um, change the paint that's on your ship, the Mantis. There are other unlockables that change the paint scheme that's on your droid, BD-1. Um, so if you like to make things look different, then uh, this is your game. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to go out of your way to find collectibles that are going to increase your power, you're going to be disappointed. Um, not to say that there are none at all. There are just very few. Um, you Here's where the poncho is actually cool in Red Dead Redemption 1. Mm. You know why? Because there was one fucking poncho <laughs> and it did look like Clint Eastwood's poncho. Mm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, I don't recall seeing any ponchos in this game that looked like Clint Eastwood or anything <laughs> even close. 
Um, another collectible that you can find is uh, something that will upgrade your companion's ability to hold stim packs. And you can use stim packs in battle. Uh, with Basically, you have a droid that's just chilling on your shoulder. His name is BD-1. And, and mm -hmm. you can press up on the D-pad and you'll snap your fingers and be like, Hey, BD-1, help me out here. And this thing will literally just shoot this green stim pack. It's like a little tube about yay big. Up, uh -huh. in, up in the air and your character catches it and like jabs himself in the arm and then he's magically healed right and the animation is pretty cool the the dialogue has a few different options sometimes they'll say help me out it'll say like bd i need healing you know he'll, he'll go through like maybe five or six preset uh phrases so you don't hear the same one every time um but if you've done it a few times you will hear them all pretty quickly okay um it doesn't give you full health it does you know depending on again the upgrades that you've acquired maybe it's only partial health maybe it's like 75 percent 80 percent you know um but uh those those things become necessary <laughs> in this mm. game especially if you're I feel like cool animations yeah the animation in this game is gorgeous um i know you played a small part of it and uh mm -hmm. like let's talk about the graphics for a moment here please the the way the lightsaber reflects off of services us uh, uh, surfaces is just jaw dropping right mm. um i must have spent like 10 minutes just walking around holding up the lightsaber and just being like how's it look over here how's it look over here how's it look down here and <laughs> where's that goddamn penny yeah right like i'm looking around like you go there's certain areas that you walk into and it's pitch black and and you get a little prompt and it's like use your lightsaber and you just you could just hold it up just like this and that's all of a sudden so cool. you have a fucking flashlight you know that's like yay long and destroys things so mm -hmm. um you know the the i think they use the unreal engine for this uh particular game which uh is a little unusual for ea but mm. Re respawn knocked it out of the park with this they did a great job with the facial animations and the uh overall look of everything in the universe it just screams star wars you know Star Wars has a reputation for having a very dirty, worn-in look in most situations, except for, yes. like, the Imperial locations, where it's very sterile and spotless, right? And this, like, nails it just to a T. It just nails it. Whether you're climbing through ancient ruins or you're in an old uh, defunct power plant or you're underground in an ice cavern slip sliding around or you're invading a, uh, a you know, Imperial base very lived in very lived in um and and just wonderful wonderful graphics um and they have those amazing transitions that are true to form with star wars 2 where you're watching uh the movies and you have a scene that goes from like okay characters having a conversation on the planet now they're in space you get that vertical or that that wipe you know from, mm -hmm. from left side of the screen to the right they do that so in the game it's just all the small details that scream Star Wars are here. And they do it so wonderfully and effortlessly. It's truly amazing. I love um, to hear that, man. You would never think that they would, you know, incorporate one of those kind of finer details. But I remember those from the original movies. It's such a minute thing, but it's so crucial to the feel. It's of, so fucking Star Wars. It's so fucking Star Wars. I mean, I couldn't have said it better, you know. <laughs> um Let's see here. What else? Um, sound. The sound of the game. Mm. I mean, man, the first time you hear that lightsaber turn on. Oh, <sighs> goosebumps. Oh, immediately. You don't Absolutely. even have to like Star Wars to just hear that sound. And it's just like, damn, man. Mm -hmm. I'm a goddamn Jedi. <laughs> and, and like when you're running into the stormtroopers and they're having conversations, you know, they're, they're having them behind these masks. So. And, and you know, the, the stormtrooper. Yes, I just mentioned it in the chat. The, the stormtrooper chatter is the best. It, it is the best. It, it truly is wonderful. Um, and, and just real quick, Killer Ciroc, like I'm not new to the Star Wars universe. I just don't pay as much attention to it as a lot of people do um look at his shirt yeah i mean so <laughs> <laughs> mic uh, drop <laughs> yeah so so i mean like don't get me wrong like i love star wars you know i i always have since i was a little mm -hmm. kid but i just don't have time to read a million novels of fan fiction and i don't read it for yeah. star trek either so anyway um 
you know, but the, the chatter of the stormtroopers, the sounds of, of the, uh, the blasters going off, the way the lightsaber is reflecting shots and that sound that it makes that you've heard in every fucking Star Wars film, it mm-hmm. is this the best, you know? It never gets old. It never gets old. It, That's it, the magic behind it. It truly doesn't. Um, let's see here. I'm kind of looking over my notes. What else can we talk about here? Well, when it comes to sound, um, hmm. kind of like moving on to like music, did, mm-hmm. did you have anything to say about the soundtrack at all? I mean, it invokes John Williams to a T. You know, okay. I mean, it, classical it is, orchestral stuff. It is a hundred percent. Again, you know, those little details. It sounds like Star Wars. They're using all the same mm-hmm. instruments that were used in the Star Wars games. Um, I'm not mm-hmm. sure who did, who the composer was. Uh, yeah, I'd love to know. Actually, let's, let's find out. Um, da, 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 Stephen Barton and Gordy Hobb. Are the composers huh. okay? Never heard of them, but that doesn't yeah. mean anything. Um, I guess uh, Stephen Barton has done a few movies, but uh, let's see here. There's there's just not a ton of information here. Stephen, okay, so he's done <clears throat> he's done a handful of movies. Um, nothing okay. that jumps out to me as anything that either one of us would have seen. Mm-hmm. Um. He's done, let's see here, some television video games, Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare, How to Train Your Dragon, Titanfall 1 and 2, Apex Legends, Watch Dogs Legion. So he's he's done some stuff, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he's done some stuff. Um, perfect choice, I think, for uh, for this game. Sure. Just knocked it out of the park. Now, his, uh, his colleague, Gordy Hobb, Looking at his discography, this guy is a pro when it comes to Star Wars. He's done uh, Old Republic. He's done Connect Star Wars. He's done Battlefront. He's done Battlefront 2 to Star Wars Squadrons. So, you know, you paired somebody who's a a super talented composer with another talented composer that's got uh, experience with the Star Wars franchise. I think uh, they just knocked it out of the park. Got a healthy marriage there, for absolutely, sure. Absolutely, absolutely. And and uh, one more thing with the sound too, it's it's thoroughly immersive too because you're going from one planet to another throughout this game, and each planet is its own identity. You know, one of these planets might be a wetlands planet. The next one is a forest. There's various degrees of uh, life already on these planets, whether it's um, human or or uh, you know uh, alien or just fauna that is native to the planet, right? Uh, mm-hmm. One of the plants you go to, Kashik, is uh, you know where the Wookies are from, and they're having fucking conversations as you're walking around, and and some of them you can eavesdrop in, some of them are directed at you, some of them you have no involvement in, and it just gives the world this very full immersive feeling. And then you go down mm-hmm. a, a hallway and you hear the hum of of uh, some generators going off. Maybe there's a force field that you can't get around. Um, just. It's living and breathing. It's living and breathing. Um, Again, those just those details, you know. Love it, man. Love to hear that. I mean, I think we talked about it once before when we were talking about this game before you reviewed it about Mm -hmm. how like the Skywalker sound studios and like everything that that Star Wars puts out sound wise when it comes to sound effects uh, Mm -hmm. primarily is just it's out of this world, literally. Right. And and, there's sounds that you've never heard before. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, there's just. I don't know how many of these sounds that they created from scratch, uh, you know, for this game or how many they relied on that were already like pre-made, you know, for the franchise. But I mean, these guys just, they just killed it. You know, they just absolutely killed it with the sound design in this game. It's awesome. Um, the story is pretty interesting. I think I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I'll mm-hmm. try to avoid spoilers as much as possible here, but, uh, basically, uh, the story is taking place five years after the great Jedi purge. And uh, Cal Kestis is hiding on a planet called Bracca. Uh, there's an accident and one of his friends uh, nearly dies. And Cal uses his powers to try to uh, save that friend. And he's so they, they pick up on it. The, the Empire basically knows that he did it and they're trying to find him. So they send two Inquisitors after him. One's called the Second Sister and one is called the Ninth Sister. And they are badass bitches, let me tell you. Uh, (laughs) Cal, Yeah, they are. I'm aware of one of them. Yeah, so um, eventually you do have some pretty good fights with them. Um, You know, the second sister is like the main main villain of the game. 
Uh, mm-hmm. But you do have a, a dealing with the Ninth Sister as well, too. And that was probably one of my most frustrating boss battles in the game. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, I might have to ask about that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's see here. Uh, long story short, though, um, Cal manages to escape after having a brief duel with the Second Sister. And he's rescued by a former knight. Uh, this is where Sarah uh, Junda comes in, played by Deborah Wilson, and her partner, Greased uh, Dietrus, uh, Dritus, uh, who's played by Daniel Roebuck. And Grease is a short alien, probably comes up to about, like, maybe maybe the nacelle of the Enterprise here. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> he's got four arms, and he's just kind of like, um, he's kind of like that sarcastic asshole that eventually mm-hmm. you kind of t- come around to loving, like... It's that guy that just can't stand at first. He seems very selfish and just eventually becomes like, you know, part of the family. Right. Wonderful. Kind of defines like most people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was kind of like, as I was describing this, I was thinking to myself, uh, boy, this sounds a little familiar to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I one or two of those. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, Sarah uh, convinces Cal to join their crew. She sees an opportunity with him and she brings him to the planet Bogano, where she's hoping that he can f- uncover a, an ancient vault. Um, while Cal is exploring um, Bogano, he encounters a droid BD one mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and uh, he shows Cal a holographic message from a former master Eno Cordova. Uh, Cordova believes that this vault that uh, Cal is trying to open uh, was built by an ancient civilization called the Zepho. And he has hidden a list of force sensitive children in said vault uh, in order to try to protect them. Um, if you want, in order to gain access to the vault, Cal must follow Cordova's path, which takes him you know, from one planet to the next. And he's constantly dealing with the empire who are trying to uncover this same list as well, except they're using brute force methods rather than the Indiana Jones methods that Cal is using. Mm. And, and this is where the game um, pretty much becomes every star Wars film you've ever seen. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, I think if, if you stop and you think about it long enough, um, the story becomes very predictable. Um, okay. There, there are elements of uh, previous Star Wars movies uh, in in this game as well, and I'm not going to go into details about those. But um, you know, you find out that the characters that you're with uh, have hidden secrets, and uh, Cal kind of goes through a bit of uh, coming to terms with some of these secrets as he sure. starts to also uncover his own and deal with his own insecurities and issues. Um, but as, ex- uh, as, uh, predictable as the story is, that doesn't make it bad. Um, it was still engaging. It was still heartwarming when it needed to be. It was still, uh, infuriating when it needed to be. Uh, but it kept me along, kept me interested, kept me rooting for the characters that I was working with and teamed up with. I was r- thoroughly, behind uh greece when he was coming around i was thoroughly behind sarah when she was dealing with her shit and and just overall like i just wanted them to succeed i wanted them to defeat evil and uh yeah man it was it man it was it was wonderful it was truly just a wonderful special game well it Um, sounds like uh a lot like uncharted you know it's like the same kind of experience in in terms of like the story and and having that yeah that uh emotional depth I, I would say so. Um, you know, the Star Wars games, uh, Star Wars games, the Star Wars movies in general, like I, I, I love them. I find them uh, just to be great films. I have fond memories, especially of the original trilogy. Um, but, you know, the reality is they tend to be little more than fairy tales, right? They're kind of uh, shallow on the surface, right? And And that's okay. I don't have a problem with that, but it is what it is. Um, mm-hmm. and, and this game, you know, it's kind of the same. And I don't mean that again, like I don't want to make this seem like it's a bad thing. It's just, uh, yeah. it's just the fact. No, it's going to be very, a, very much a good thing. It's like what you mm-hmm. said about the story, right? You know, kind of predictable, but that that's not necessarily a bad thing. And mm-hmm. I think it was predictable in uncharted four as well. Sure. Um, and sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't. Mm. 
It, it's just about how it's delivered, how how that predictable story is delivered is is what makes the difference. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, let's see here. Just other things worthy of note. You know, uh, the voice actors. You had a tremendous cast. I think they did a great job picking uh, people that were appropriate. Um, you know, it's tough with video games to find a, a balance between name recognition and talent i feel and i think mm -hmm. they did a pretty good job here you know they did get a couple of big names i, I don't know that i would say uh cameron monaghan is is a big name but i feel like coming out of uh shameless he will be mm -hmm. um, i think so i don't watch the show so i i can't really speak for his you know his acting chops in that but i can tell you like he was believable as Cal in this game. Uh, Deborah Wilson was believable. Uh, Tony Amendola, who played uh, uh, Eno Cordova, uh, he's uh, been in Dexter and a bunch of other movies and stuff. He's got quite a resume. Um, I thought he did a fantastic job. Uh, Forrest Whitaker is always great. I wish he had a larger role in the, in the game, quite frankly. He was kind of... Uh, kind of confined to one planet which was a little disappointing mm. and then the it's probably too expensive um yeah and i'm being serious you're probably right um because they did refer to the character numerous times after you encounter him and like oh he's over here doing this thing <laughs> you know so <laughs> like the character is still in the universe but the actor wasn't um and i was really impressed with the uh voice acting for the uh, second sister and ninth sister as well too elizabeth grueling played the second sister misty lee played the ninth sister um you know, both of them, I thought, did a great job as well, too. Uh, just just a wonderful game. Um, you know, I think it was a wonderful way to wrap up 2020 for me. Mm -hmm. I needed it because, uh, you know, 2020 was a rough year for a lot of people, myself included. And, um, you know, there were some pretty heavy games that uh, I played. Last of Us 1 and 2, Doom Eternal, oh, yeah. um, just to name a few. And this game was just fun. From the moment I fired it up to the moment I put in, you know, I saw the credits rolling on the screen. I had fun. I just had fun. I um, love it, man. I, I think you can always rely on Star Wars for that. You yes. know, it, it never lets you down when it comes to that fun aspect and also something that's just more uh, mood lifting, if you mm. will. Yeah. And, and it certainly was, you know, it's nothing better than watching, you know, good try to defeat evil and triumph. And they nailed it, in my opinion. I think they nailed it. Uh, I hope that they make a sequel. Um, I will buy it immediately if they do. <laughs> um, and uh, man, you know, it wasn't a perfect game uh, by any means. You know, the, the, the controls worked pretty well, but they weren't like, they weren't a hundred percent. You know, there were definitely some parts where like, I think maybe they should have been a little bit more responsive. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, even like the boss battles, I got frustrated with some of those boss battles because they were really challenging. Um, but, you know, I put the game down, come back the next day, come at it again with like a, a fresh look, a breath of fresh air and maybe a little more patience and uh, paid off. Yeah. Well, when you mix like really difficult boss battles with subpar controls or even controls that are quite you know, fine tuned, but there's mm. still some, some tuning that should take place, which is kind of what you're describing yeah. that can really make or break like your, uh, aggression levels, uh, yeah. within a boss fight. Yeah. I because mean, you're frustrated with a control aspect. Well, I think like for me, the worst thing was, uh, when you're trying to heal yourself, right. And you're, you get attacked in the middle of a healing motion. I understand that maybe, you know, the, the attack might need to take precedence, but I think it also depends where in the animation you are. Because, like, for example, in one fight, I was facing uh, a boss and, you know, I had some good distance between me and the enemy and they threw a lightsaber at me as the stim pack was on its way down and my mm. character had it in his hand. And so, like, all I need to do is just the animation of, you know, poking myself with it and I'm healed. Yep. But the the animation of getting hit with the lightsaber, uh, like, basically just canceled out and did you it, it canceled that out and killed me <laughs> and, and that was like the most frustrating thing because like you're you're really struggling to kind of put some distance with you know, with you and them and just just heal up you know i got like i fucking ration these things i got seven of them why can't i do this and then you're dead oh my gosh <laughs> dude i i cannot 
uh, oh man, I really don't want to have to go here, but I'm going to do it. Yeah. So I hate to refer to Dark Souls, but I'm going to because there are so many moments in those games where the same kind of shit happens, where you're going mm. to chug what's called an Estus flask, which is your way of healing. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of chugging it, you get like swiped by like a boss attack and you'll just be completely annihilated while mm. you're healing. Yeah. And just that those seconds of, of a difference there of being attacked and finishing the animation are so crucial mm. um, that it could be so aggravating that you want to just break something, but then you realize, well, to be fair, I probably should have timed this a little bit differently so I can get through the animation. But sometimes those those frames of animation can be all the difference. It's kind of like fighting games as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I think it's harder to measure frames when you're looking at a 3D world, you know? Yeah. So, but I mean, minor complaints aside, um, I can't recommend the game enough, uh, especially for those of you that maybe have been waiting on getting it uh, patched up for the Series S or Series X. Um, now's the time to play it. I would love to take some time to circle back to it and check it out and see what this game looks like now. Uh, I hear it is a massive improvement. Um, I may still do that at some point this week. I just don't want to fall back into it because I have so much else that I'm playing right now that I, I just really want to stick with. Understandable. So, um, Well, solid review, man. It's you. definitely piqued my interest more than, than before. That's, that's for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. So, that's all I have. <laughs> and more importantly, it's a cool game, man. It is a cool game. Um, Star Wars is some cool shit, man. And uh, this is a cool game. So. Love to hear it. Yeah. So you're working on what? Uncharted 3 right now? Yeah. Um, I'm hoping to have that wrapped tonight. I'm on the last chapter, so it should take me no more than an hour. Okay. And then uh, we'll see from there. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually in the middle of two games. Uh, Haven and hitman 2 mm. so i'm looking forward to talking about both of those once i've put a little bit more time into them uh haven i'm probably about halfway through if i had to guess um i have a lot to say about that game we have a lot to say uh, yes moving forward we are beating games people we are we are <laughs> we are beating games in 2021 <laughs> i started keeping a list like an actual like spreadsheet of, of the games with a start date and end date like star rating and stuff yeah i okay. know that was part of your plan i think it's a good one i'm, I'm a fucking nerd man <laughs> <laughs> must have data uh data to prove. so on that note i think uh that brings us to the end of our show did you have anything else that you wanted to uh mention before we wrap it up or uh play both of these games yeah i i, I think those are great words to live by mm. so all right, folks, thank you uh, to everybody who tuned into the uh, Twitch stream tonight. We really appreciate you guys swinging by. Thank you to everybody that has downloaded the show. January has been a wonderful month for us so far. We hope to continue that momentum going forward into February. Uh, check us Certainly. out on the web at www.wdgrpodcast.com. Of course, we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch at WDGRpodcast. Will, how can they find you? soundcloud.com slash will underscore gear and you can find me on twitter at science storm and uh, thanks for listening folks we'll see you next time bye <laughs>